Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk tonight. Really appreciate you all coming out. Um, I see that we have around 11 people joining right now. Um, hopefully, there'll be a few more in just a minute. Um, but just give them just a, another minute and see if we have anyone else join in a second. All right, cool. Well, I think, uh, think we're pretty ready to start now. So um, welcome, like I said, thank you for coming out to my talk tonight on Intro to Distributed Systems. Um, I really hope that you all enjoy this talk. And um, at the end, please feel free to ask any questions that you may have. Um, this topic can get a bit into the weeds, um, and I try to make it as approachable as possible. But please, please don't hesitate if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to answer any. So like I said, this is going to an intro to distributed systems and let's get started. So the goals of this talk that I have are first to present a high level overview of distributed systems, um, give some trade offs compared to typical monolithic systems, um, and then go into several common components that you might see in a distributed system. Things like a web or proxy server, a load balancer, a cache, a queue, and databases. Things that in software engineering you probably have heard of, but just maybe don't know quite how they fit into a system yet. Um, but I also really want to make this introduction as approachable to, as possible to anyone uh, at Launch School. And I really want to just show many of the fascinating concepts of distributed systems. And so, hold on, that's too far. Okay, so why should you learn about distributed systems? And here's some motivation. First, there's a really high chance that you'll have to work on them in your career as a software engineer. Most systems these days out in companies in the wild are distributed systems. And it's also a very common interview topic for jobs at larger tech companies or startups. In fact, knowing distributed systems fairly well can mean that you can even skip a few levels when you apply to jobs at companies, meaning you could start as a software engineer number two or even a senior software engineer. And in fact, um, in my interview process with DigitalOcean, two of my interviews covered entirely everything about distributed systems. So it's really a common concept with um, some of these companies out there. Also, there's lots of room for innovation in this area. So if you find yourself in your few years working at a company, you could be working on a product or even a system where you might have to create something new or um, innovative with uh, a concept in this area. So it's pretty exciting. And I think it's a very interesting topic. So let's start off with just some kind of definitions of what is a distributed system. And one of the best definitions I found was this quote, which is a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. So what exactly does that mean? Well, Usually, and this is how I felt when I was just starting at launch school and um, kind of thinking deeply about how we have software systems that we interact with, this is kind of what it feels like it happens to us. We send a request to a server for some web content, could be just a regular website, or it could be trying to get a feed of all the latest tweets from Twitter, and we get a response that we see. And for, to our eyes, that's really all that we experience. We just send a request and we get something back. And so this is kind of what it may seem like um, these systems are. And actually, this is pretty much kind of like what a monolithic system might look like. But in fact, what's actually happening with distributed systems is there's a whole bunch more going on where you have all these different components that are handling your request. You've got servers that are taking your requests and figuring out where to put them. And it's also routing this request to other components, which eventually find their way to a database to get you some data to get back to you in response. But the thing is that you don't actually see any of this going on. All you see is this, in my opinion, when you first start off. You just send a request and get some response back. And this is kind of where that quote is coming from. You have all these components that you don't see exist in the system that you're interacting with. But if one of these components breaks down, then you may not be able to get a response back. You just get an error page or please come back later and you don't know what happened. 
And that's kind of what's going on in a distributed system. And so before we get into our overview, there's three terms that I wanted to touch on first to know as kind of like the core pillars of distributed systems. And I mentioned them here just to kind of get them into your brain. And I'm going to mention them again and again in the talk. It's kind of like that circular learning we have at launch school where the more times you kind of encounter a word or topic, it'll kind of sink in further and further. So don't worry if these don't latch into your brain right now. But the three terms are consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And really all they mean is that a consistent system is where you always get the most recent data from the system when you request it. Availability is when you can always access the system, even if the data you get isn't the most up-to-date. And lastly, partition tolerance is just that a system can operate when it's separated by the network. So once again, I'm going to go over these again, and I'll even say these definitions again, but really something to just kind of latch into your brain right now. And so let's start off by talking about monoliths. And a monolith is simply when an entire system is located on one machine or a group of machines in one location. And the, a monolith will contain every component for the system everything from the web server, which is receiving user requests, to the database that's storing your data and everything just in one machine or one location. And all of your services are tightly coupled together. And you know, for students who are just starting their journey in launch school, as you work through the courses and you get to the later um, backend courses where you're building systems where you store data and you're handling requests, you'll kind of see this as well. And you're just building a very small monolith where you have everything just in one central place. And there's benefits to actually having a monolith as your system. It's very easy to start with and maintain, at least for a good while. And it's very well suited for small applications and systems that don't need to worry about having users all around the world or handling hundreds of thousands of requests a day. So it's something that most of us start off with in our journey as a software engineer and just something that you know, we can maintain on our own um, fairly easily. And the main things with those pillars that define a monolith are that usually they're consistent and available. When you interact with a monolith with just this one machine having everything going on um, in the system, you're gonna get the most recent data usually when you send a request, and it's usually gonna be accessible when you want it to. Everything is located in one place is the kind of the core thing I wanna get across to you all the different ser services communicate to each other fairly quickly and you can access your data pretty quickly. But there comes pro um, some problems with monoliths when you start having to face growing your system. So let's say that your app gets super popular overnight, gets posted on Hacker News, Reddit, or gets trending on Twitter and suddenly you have hundreds of thousands of people trying to access your content and your system isn't built for that. So what do you do? How do you kind of handle this growth and make sure that people can still access your content? Well, you can do what we call vertical scaling, where you simply just build a bigger machine. You add more RAM, you get more CPU and more disk space, and essentially you're just making this monolith even bigger and bigger and bigger so that it can handle all this extra requests and all this extra data that you're suddenly getting from users. You know, you might have to get a bigger database to store all this new data you're getting from all these new users. And this can handle your growth for a while. But the thing is that eventually you're going to have to pay a lot more just to build your machine a little bit bigger. And it's going to get insanely expensive as you go more and more and more. So this doesn't always work once you get past a certain point. And that's where we get into this point of going up versus going wide. And like I said, initially, it's cheaper to go vertically up by buying a bigger machine. But as you can kind of see from this graph on the right, in this dotted line for vertical scaling, it's cheaper, but then at a certain point, your costs rise sharply up because it just is inordinately expensive to get even more memory or an even bigger data things. So at some point, what the actually occurs is that it's cheaper for you to instead say, hey, I'm just going to buy some several smaller machines and just distribute everything. Just put uh, 
on all these machines, have all the machines talk to each other, and it's actually cheaper that way. And that's what the solid line shows, is that past this point, you can just keep buying more and more machines and it'll actually be cheaper in the long run. And the second way is what we call horizontal scaling, which is really what distributed systems is about. It's just spreading everything out over many, many machines. And there's another problem with monoliths, which is, well, what if your machine burns down? You know, something breaks in your system or you experience, like I said, more requests than you can handle even past the point of what you're used to with your um, single monolith. And there's also the case of, let's say, okay, your monolith stores data, it handles user requests, it modifies data. And the big thing is you really just need to get a bigger database. And so you really just need to modify that. But with a monolith, things can be very tightly coupled, which means that you have to kind of take everything down at times just to fix this one service, just to upgrade this one service. And all this means is that it's going to take time to rebuild your monolith and you'll likely you lose users to competitors in the meantime, as you're trying to fix your monolith. And this uh, GIF is from Silicon Valley where they're essentially a very similar scenario where their service gets more users than they ever expected. And they're just frantically adding more and more hardware to their system and eventually just burns down. So this is what usually comes to mind anytime I think about this situation. And so that's where distributed systems can come to the rescue. Like I said, with horizontal scaling, if you spread out your services and your data over several machines, you can lower your costs because it's cheaper to get several smaller machines than just keep building one big machine. Additionally, you can also duplicate some components of your system to handle you know, any kind of disruption by your users if a single piece breaks. So you just have some redundancy in your system. If one thing fails, you may have a second copy of it to take over. You can also replicate your data by having many databases so that if one of your databases burns down, you have a backup that can just immediately come online and can handle taking in more data. And finally, um, with distributed systems, you can kind of spread out your user requests so that no one machine gets too much traffic and breaks down. If you suddenly have hundreds of thousands of requests all trying to add data to your one database, it might just be unable to handle all that and just have a big slowdown in that case um, or miss something. But if you have many databases and you can kind of spread out your user requests, well, then you don't have to worry about one machine just handling too much. And like I said, so here you can see kind of what a distributed system might look like <clears throat> with all these different components, especially those group of databases I talked about on the far right. We'll get into what each of these components means and kind of its role to play in distributed systems. But <clears throat> this is kind of a key point of what I was talking about is on the far right here, you have these arrows indicating all these user requests and it might be too much for one database, but if you have many databases, you can kind of distribute it out and solve your traffic issue. Some other benefits of a distributed system are, okay, like I said, it's cheaper past a certain point. It's worth saying this twice, but also architecturally, it allows you to have a modular system. You can modify and scale each component independently of each other. And you can also swap out components with replacements. Um, and lastly, you can decouple your services. Now each component has its specific job to perform. So instead before where your monolith just had everything inside of it and had to handle everything at once, now you have these components which can each do their job, do it well. And if one of these components starts kind of underperforming, you can kind of swap it out or um, improve it by itself without having to take the whole system down. So there's benefits to having a distributed system with every little piece um, in the, together doing its job. So this sounds all great, right? But there's a catch. There's always a catch. And the issue is that now we have a network partition. And here are those three terms again, partition tolerance, consistency, and availability. And what I mean by a network partition is that once you have all these machines doing their jobs, but they're no longer on the same machine. They're separated by the network. And the issue is that you can't control the network. Once you send some data, some information over the network to a machine, you can't really control what happens to it while it's on the network. 
you know, some of that information could be dropped by the network. The network could face a slowdown. There could be some issues like a wire, um, a cable that's cut by accident that you didn't even know about and you lose some data. And this is what we talk about is that you have this uncontrollable thing between all your machines. And the issue that this brings up is that you can't have everything in life. And when you have a network partition, well, suddenly you have this choice between, well, now all my machines are separated by the network and I have to choose between being consistent or available. And I'm going to dig into exactly what this means. But essentially the big point is with a distributed system is that everything is separated by the network and suddenly you have this choice between consistency and availability, whereas monoliths were just consistent and available. And so let me kind of illustrate what I mean by this network partition. We have a situation where a user sends an update of their data to our system. Maybe they wrote a face, it's Facebook, they wrote a status, but then they realize they made some mistakes and they want to update that status. So they go ahead and do that. So they send a request to update the data and then they refresh and see their updated data. But since the network is unpredictable, it's just on the wire and we can't control that, we may or may not have this update to the data stored by the time they ask for it. So then our system has a choice. We could say, sorry, I can't tell you yet. We're waiting to finish and confirm your update. And if we choose that, then what we're choosing is to be consistent, but not available. We're choosing to tell them, I can't tell you what you want because it's not up to date yet. But in that case, they can't see what they want. The other choice, is, the other option is we can say here, this is what we have right now. It might be true, but we can't say for sure. Then your system's available. Your user can access the system. It can, they can get a response to their request, but it's not consistent with the action they performed. They made an update, but they don't see that update yet. And here's an example kind of to make this even more clear. So we have two kind of hypothetical systems that are distributed and one made a choice of availability, but one made a choice of consistency. And so Amazon focuses on availability. They care more about ensuring that their users can always go to Amazon and can always add items to their shopping cart. They can always be shopping. That's their model. And I don't know about you, but I've faced this sometimes where I'm on Amazon and I'll go to their site, but my shopping cart doesn't have all the items in my cart that I added. There's something missing, or maybe there's accidentally two copies of an item when I only wanted one. Um, another case is where maybe you had some items on a wish list and you deleted them, but then when you look at your wish list again, they're still there. And that's kind of what is going on with Amazon is that they're not giving you the most up-to-date data but they're choosing to make sure you can always access the system. So their motto is give me the site right now. I don't care anything else. On the other hand, we have consistency and one institute that might prefer this is a banking system where with banks, what they really care about is that you have the correct data when you access your accounts. You want, they want to make sure that you see the most accurate financial information before you choose to make purchases or investment decisions. And if they can't give you the most up-to-date data, you might get a message of come back later when we're done updating. Or the site might be really slow at times, but that's because in the background, they're making sure that every database, every data store has the exact same information for you before they give it back to you. They want to ensure that they're consistent. And so the model for this system might be, you'll see it when it's accurate. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about with this choice that we have. When your system is distributed for all the benefits a distributed system gives you and everything is separated by the network that you can't control, you have to choose between being available or being consistent. You can't be both. Additionally, there are some issues with distributed systems and they're not minor concerns. So the first is that distributed systems require a lot of forethought and focus on architecture to get right. It's a lot of figuring out how all the pieces do their job and also how they fit together. You also have to figure out how to pass data correctly 
directly between each component. And whether you need to modify anything beforehand, if a user sends a request to the system and that system needs to pass it off to a different component, it needs to figure out if it needs to modify it, add some more information, and just kind of manage that data. Once again, we have these unreliable networks and it's something we can't usually control. Additionally, if we have multiple databases, it can be a pain to handle having the correct data everywhere, which I'll talk about in just a second. It can be difficult to debug issues sometimes with the distributed systems because you have all these components working together and data is being passed between them. And if an issue happens in one component, you might have to work through debugging the entire path that data flowed from one component to the next before you can maybe see where something broke or how it broke and fix it. And lastly is that distributed systems can sometimes have more opportunities for bottlenecks or single points of failure. And what I mean by that is that you have all these components working together, but there's one component that's, a, that's uh, handling some data and it's not being efficient. So it's kind of choking the entire system. So that's a component that needs to be fixed. Or maybe you didn't have redundancy in your system and one component breaks. And like we said, sometimes when one component breaks, the whole thing um, breaks down and you know what happened. Now that we've kind of talked about the trade-offs of distributed systems and monoliths, let's go into some common components of distributed systems, which are these main ones that I kind of listed out, which are a web or proxy server, databases, caches, load balancers, and queues. Let's start with a web and proxy server. This is kind of the gateway to the distributed system where it takes users requests and can eventually package the response back. So a web or proxy server, its main job is really to handle requests, HTTP handling. It's gonna take in those client requests and it's gonna route those requests to the correct component. And then once the system has a response, it's gonna send the response back to the client. And it solves really the problem of of, I have this request, which backend piece do I send it to? So if we go back here, you can see that the server here, the web or proxy server, it can route the request to a load balancer, a queue, a cache. It has to kind of figure out where it needs to send the request it received. Then we have our databases. And databases solve the problem of how do we store our data over time? And in fact, there are many different types of databases and some distributed systems can even use many different types at the same time. Each type of database has a specific use case with differences between them. And in the world of databases, we generally divide them into two categories, which are SQL databases like Postgres, MySQL, SQLite, and NoSQL databases like a document, a graph, a key value database. And the main um, kind of distinction are that SQL databases allow you to easily analyze and slice and dice your data, but they don't scale horizontally very well. No SQL databases do scale horizontally, but are not great for analytics. They're not great for slicing and dicing data. And you can kind of see at the bottom of the slide, I have a couple different types here. Relational is really actually just what we call SQL databases. Uh, key value, document graph in memory, um, which is really a cache that we'll talk about real soon. Um, and search is just a bit finicky. Um, I actually don't know too much about what that is, but a great resource to kind of dig more into this and why a system might have several databases at the same time is this blog here called All Things Distributed, which is the blog of the CTO of Amazon. And he talks about this situation here and a lot of the concepts that I talked about in this talk. Um, so really great blog to check out. And I was kind of talking several times before about how in a distributed system, we can have replicated databases. And I wanna to touch on that now that we're talking about databases. So just like how we can have many machines working together, each doing their job in a distributed system, we can horizontally scale our databases too. And in this way, we have several copies of our database that store our data so that in case one burns down, we still have that data for users that they can access. Another cool thing about having many databases for our system is that we can also 
have some databases used only for users to get data from or reading data and some that users can write data to. And so this kind of handles a big thing about distributed systems, which is handling reads versus writes. And this is helpful if the system that you're building or working on has more of one than the other. And so one example is like Twitter. Twitter has so many users, but most of the users in their time on Twitter usually just look at what other people tweet. They're reading data from the data database. And so Twitter has many, many more databases that are just to grab data from and display to the user or read. But in your time on Twitter, you probably only send a few tweets a day, a week, however, and they don't need as many databases for writing data. And so they have a few that are just for writing data. And so this is one of the benefits as well, is that you can kind of spread out all of your tra traffic of your quests, separate them between reads and writes, and then have your system handle it like that. But then there's another low issue here with replicated databases in distributed systems, which is, well, do we have the same data everywhere? And that's not always the case. So if a user makes an update to the database, like in this diagram here, where they say, I want a variable foo set to bar, well, actually let's say like they just wanna have something foo set to bar, they might send it to one database in our system and it gets that update, it stores it, and it tells the user, yep, it's stored, but then something happens and it doesn't get a chance to tell the other databases this update. Well, in that case, now we have different databases with different information in our system. And this is an issue with distributed systems, which I can't really get too much into because it gets really into the weeds. And I feel like I've presented a lot in this talk already, but it's definitely an interesting topic. And I have a reference I can um, point you to later that talks more about it. But this is a pretty um, common issue with distributed systems to be aware of, is that when you have many databases, you might have an issue where the data is not accurate across all of them. Next, we'll go into a cache. And a cache is a very specific type of data store for storing data. And what it's used is really to store data that users request most frequently. And its benefit is that it takes load off the database. And so essentially what it means here is that if you have hundreds of thousands of users and they're all trying to read data from your system, but some of that data is frequently requested over and over and over again, well, you can just put that data on a cache and then all those re requests for that specific data can go to the cache, which means that there's fewer requests going to your database and kind of lessening the user load on those databases. So it really helps to kind of make sure that some of your databases, your backend components aren't on fire for handling too many requests. Now, a cool thing about a cache is that also depending on you know, what data needs to be read from it, you can put it in many different places in the system. Right here, I have it here close to where the client requests data because that might be where it is. It might be that, you know, we go to the web server, the server says, hey, let me check the cache first to see if we have the, it in the cache first. And if it is, they can just send it back to the user. Otherwise, they would have to go all the way to the databases. And so the cache really solves the problem of how do I speed up the client requests for certain data that's always requested? Now, caches do have some very difficult problems with them. And first is that cache invalidation is hard. In fact, the common saying in software engineering is there's only two really difficult problems. There's naming variables and there's cache invalidation. And the thing with cache invalidation is that if that frequently requested data gets updated, you then have to go into the cache, find it, and then update it, and try and do that before users get stale data, something that's not accurate anymore. Another issue with caches is that they can get full, is that they can get a lot of data that they have to store up to the point where they can't hold any more data. And so then you have to figure out, well, which data from this cache do I remove to give up more space for new data? Oftentimes, we use a principle called least recently used, where the cache checks all the data that's requested, finds the data that's requested the least, and removes it. 
and that frees up some space. But there's other options too. There's even some that you use most frequently, which actually ditches the most frequently requested data. Um, so there's a lot of different options for that. But a cache has a lot of benefits, but it also brings its own problems. And that's kind of a common theme with distributed systems. We have all these components. They do really cool things and they can really help us out, but they also can bring new problems to have to deal with. Next, we can talk about a load balancer. And a load balancer is a piece of software or hardware that distributes requests evenly across servers, databases, other components. So if we have hundreds of thousands of requests, and that would be too many requests for one database, one backend piece, a load balancer can say, I'll send 100 to this one, I'll send 100 to this one, I'll send 100 to this third one, and just kind of go around and around again, making sure that no one backend piece gets too many requests and then burns down. A load balancer is really great though, because you can put it in front of any kind of area in your system that needs to handle lots of requests and all you do is just duplicate those pieces and then the load balancer can kind of spread it out so we could put a load balancer here with our group of databases maybe our system is so big that we have multiple caches and then we can put a load balancer there to kind of distribute to the caches so it's a very um it's a very useful piece of software that can fit into many areas and Really, like I said, solves the problem of, well, how do I make sure that none of my machines receive more requests than they can handle? And that last piece I want to talk about is a queue. And a queue is actually a fundamental data structure, very common in interview questions. And what it does is that it takes requests, takes data, and holds them until they can be processed. And when you put um, things on the queue, it's enqueued. And then when it takes off, it gets dequeued. So, you know, in our system, requests can be put into a queue and then they get put there and then they get taken out when we can handle them. And a queue follows the principle of first in, first out. If you were the first request in, you're going to be the first request out. Very similar to uh, a line at the lunchroom or so. So it solves the problem of how do I manage requests when my servers are too busy? So in case, let's say, we really are handling more requests than we can manage, then we can put some in a queue until our system can then handle them more gracefully. Now, a little hang up with queues is that it's best used for asynchronous requests. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it essentially means a request that a user sends and then the user can go do other things. It's not like a request where I'm on the website I send a request and I see the little um, screen loading and I have to wait until I get a response to confirm that my request was handled. I can just send it off and the system can say, yep, request received, we'll handle it when you can. And then the user can go do other things on the website. So that's really a good, um, a good use case with queues. And that's a lot of info. Um, we're reaching the end of the talk. And I know that that was a lot to take in, covered a lot of things. And distributed systems inherently have a lot going on with them, with many subtopics to learn about. But if you want to learn about them, I would suggest that you take your time and don't hesitate to review the concepts many, many times, just like circular learning at launch school. In fact, there's a lot of topics I didn't touch on with distributed systems, which could each probably have a presentation of their own, such as consensus of data in databases. How do you make sure that everyone agrees on the same data? Forms of database replication. Sharding your data, which is basically saying, instead of giving the same data to all my databases, I'm gonna put specific data on each database. That's a very complicated topic. Transactions, which is basically ensuring that a update to the database is, you know, guaranteed. Eventual consistency, which is a big thing with uh, distributed systems. Two-phase commits and microservices, which is a whole nother one as well. And I just want to leave you that if you do hear about microservices systems, just know that it's a certain architectural style for building distributed systems. But that alone is also a complete talk on its own. And so here are some references. Um, I can post these slides, um, uh, but you can also find these um, when this talk is recorded, um, but more than happy to post them so you can get the links. 
But these are all the resources I used when learning about distributed systems. It really helped me um, understand all of these components and then also do well in my interviews. Starting with base DS and um, a thorough introduction. There's the all things distributed blog again. A primer and database replication talks everything about how to handle data amongst many databases. Um, and then we have two really good talks on NoSQL databases and microservices. And lastly, um, a really excellent book by O'Reilly on, um, on this kind of uh, topic. It's the definitive guide. It's very thorough and it's very dense. But if you pick this up, please take your time with it. <laughs> and it's really nothing, not something I'd recommend to anyone unless they are post-launch school. Uh, I would recommend it to all capstone grads. Um, it's a really good book that covers all this in detail, but definitely not something you want to pick up while you're in the core curriculum. But I did want to leave it here just for if any of this has piqued your interest, then I want to leave you these references so you can dig more into it. And thanks for listening. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions and let me know what you thought of this talk. If anything was confusing, anything needed to be more clarified, if I went too fast, please, I'd really like to know how to improve on this talk. And with that, um, if anyone has a question I'd like to put in the chat or q and I'm more than happy to answer. Okay, so the question is, when you begin to build out a distributed system, since there are so many components, how do you go about setting it up? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and I think it's one that really depends upon what your situation is. So many times, like I said, um, you kind of have to make a choice of whether, what kind of like trade-offs you have to deal with. So like I said, with um, distributed systems and monoliths, at some point it's gonna to be too expensive to go vertical scaling up instead, and instead you can go horizontally and buy more machines. So once you kind of do decide to go horizontally, I think it really is just what kind of problems are you facing? Are you, facing um, too many user requests and you need to um, kind of handle that amongst several databases. Well, then we're talking about a load balancer. Um, and then also, if you are having a lot of user requests, but you know, while you are looking at what users are requesting and you start noticing, hey, hey there's a lot of requests for the same type of data, then it might be useful to add a cache. So, you know, there is quite a bit of forethought put into play, but I just want to kind of emphasize that because there's so many um, complications distributed systems, you really want to think about what your problems are and which pieces solve that problem. There's a, there's a really good article out there called um, You Are Not Google. And what it basically says is don't try and do everything Google does because you're not as big as Google. And so really just kind of see, I would say you have your system, notice what kind of problems you're facing and then pick the components to fit that. So if I were to build a system and I really wanna just start off with a, a web proxy server and my database and then go from there, that lays out the groundwork for if I need to add a cache then my proxy server can send that request to the cache. Or um, if I do need multiple databases, then I can have um, that set up and a proxy server can kind of handle that for a bit and then add a load balancer. So I guess what I'm just trying to say is look at the problems that your system is facing or you're likely to face and then add the components you need for that. is my long-winded answer. So Alex says, excellent talk, thank you. Just wanna note that on my previous jobs, network outages happen more frequently than not. Yep, that's the thing. So that's really what we're talking about with network partition is not only can you not um, accurately always know about network outages um, or like how fast something happens, but you know, someone could trip on a wire and then your system has to handle that. So. Uh, really is an issue as to why we need to choose consistency or availability. Uh, how would you handle or prevent a DDoS attack, hypothetically speaking? That's a very good question. Um, and for people who don't know, um, a DDoS attack is essentially where um, 
uh, some hackers or malicious users basically overwhelm your system with um, just a lot of more requests than it can handle, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I've never had to handle that, so I can't accurately say. So I'm going to have to say that I would have to get back to you on that. Thanks for coming out and have a good night, y'all.